welcome to Horror Rewind. This is Kelly Florence. And I'm Meg Hoftall. I'm eating Milk Duds and it like got stuck in my teeth right at that moment. But I'm Meg Hoftall. Uh, welcome. And today we're talking about Basket Case. Meg, have you seen this movie? Well, now I have. <laughs> uh, but no, I hadn't seen this movie before. Had you? I've never seen Basket Case. I knew what it was and like I knew the image. I knew the video cover. It was one of those that I never picked up. And I have to tell you going in because I think it's going to cloud my entire talking of this movie. But there was a point in this movie where my opinion flipped and I and the whole thing is tainted for me. Okay. I don't even know where to begin with this movie. I don't know. I don't know how to even feel or what I think or this is like I, I, it was like a roller coaster for me because, first of all, I'd never heard of it. I didn't know anything about it. I wish, I kind of wish I hadn't read the description before I clicked on it because I think that would have been even more fun. Um, it brought up a lot. Like I thought about that episode of the X Files Humbug a lot. And here's the thing: on paper, I think this is a great idea. If somebody told me this is this is an idea I have, this is a great idea. I think. For a movie. Um, I see how this is a cult movie. Because it's so out there wacky. I just, I don't know. I don't know what I think. So let's let's talk about some facts. And then I'm going to tell you the roller coaster that I went on. But my roller coaster was had upward trajectory. And then it fell off. And, it, and then the ride stopped. I was in a yeah. pit. So... This came out in 1982. It was written and directed by Frank Henenlotter. It's 74% on Rotten Tomatoes. Which is more than Dolls. Yeah, from last week. And this only had a budget of $35,000. So how does knowing that fact affect your opinion? I think that I like I like the spirit of I have 35 grand and I'm going to make a movie. I like the spirit of that and I encourage people to do that because filmmaking isn't just for people who have millions upon millions of dollars to spend. So I, I do like that. And I think that they were trying to think out how to use their 35 grand. I would have told them have less actors, rethink your, your settings and stuff. And then you have more money for your stop motion animation and stuff like that. But I mean, good for them, I guess. So I, I didn't like it started and I didn't mind how cheesy and low budget it was. I was like, okay, you know, this could be fun. Um, some things I also appreciated just because it's set in 82, they were showing New York City back when Times Square wasn't touristy. Like, it didn't become, like, touristy and safe, quote-unquote, for for tourists to be in until, like, the 90s. So, the 80s, it was, like, a rough place to be. Yeah, I mean, I've heard story of, you know, New York um, sort of before Giuliani cleaned it up, so to speak. And when I was actually doing some sort of internet research on this movie, I saw that one of the sort of good marks it had or good reviews said like it, they actually do a really decent job of showing like this really scuzzy New York. And, you know, a lot of times we see like the upper West side and we see Manhattan and we see rich people and, you know, on friends, they're in an apartment no one can afford and things like that. But this is like the reality of, where you would be living in New York if you just showed up with your twin brother in a basket. Uh, yes. <laughs> so the acting in this movie, I mean, they didn't, they didn't pay their actors or they hardly paid them. And just to give an idea of, I guess, how far $35,000 could go back in the day, the hotel he's staying in is $20 a night. So, you know, <laughs> but budget is, is relative. That's true. 35K stretched a lot further. Um, I was watching, so this was on Amazon Prime and they have like the trivia on there. And one of them, one of the trivia was like, and I noticed it because they said it. I don't know if I would have noticed it otherwise. But at one point, David, I think is, is the character's name. He refers to his brother as David. Like that's how loosely edited this was. Like his brother's name was Belial or something like that. And he calls him David. So at one point. So 
you know, the acting, the editing, everything is pretty, you know, roughshod. You know, pretty, um, at this point, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go along for this ride. He uses an old school phone book, which is just like a nice throwback um, moment. Because I was like, oh, look, it's the 80s. He goes and buys a bunch of burgers for the thing. And, oh, they show the Twin Towers. I thought everybody was adorable. Like, I like all these people. I don't mind non-actors sometimes. I think that can be fun. Uh, something I read about the ho- the guy who plays the hotel manager, he died at the age of 39. So I was like, oh, who is this guy? What has he done? And he died. Bummer. I, I just realized as you're talking, I know what moment it was that. I just Get ready. <laughs> I just realized what moment it was. Um, so now I'm thinking about that and I'm disturbed. But um, here's the thing. When he feeds the twin brother the, the hamburgers, it's funny. Like they yeah. make it funny and he like, he kind of like, doesn't like the buns and he throws the buns out and he really likes the meat. And, you know, it's, it's funny. So I was like, okay, I think I can get behind this because it's cheeky and kind of funny. You know? And I thought like, this is the right way to build up anticipation for the creature in a low budget way or in for any budget really, because we were just getting little, you know, hints and little peaks, but we didn't have to see the whole thing, which I would have preferred. if We never saw the whole thing, but I guess we kind of have to, because that's the point of the movie. Ah. <sighs> Here's the thing, and it's kind of like with the budget, too. They went for it. They're like, we are going to show Belial, or whatever his name is. Like, you're going to see him. He's going to be doing stuff. And I sort of, I kind of appreciate that sort of, like, gonzo mentality of, like, this is going to be crazy and wacky, and we, we're we going to see his devor- deformed twin. And, I mean, it is kind of disturbing. Like, I feel like some images, like, from um, when you see them as children or whatever, like, that's scary and kind of weird. And, I mean, I, I definitely see the cult appeal of this movie. Um, but at the same time, it probably pushes it too far. And they definitely don't rely on like shadow and um, subtleties. I mean, it's definitely here is the creature. It's the eighties. We don't have a lot of money and use your imagination. Yeah. I, I mean, I was liking before they showed everything, I was liking seeing like the little hand grabbing the doorknob and the blood and the gore. And then all of a sudden, you know, okay, he's out there and we're seeing everything. He's getting jealous because this guy is making out with this nurse slash receptionist who, was bold and asked him out. Were you ever brave like this woman? Did you ask boys out? Ooh, good question. Um, I was bold. I had that. I had the ability to scare boys away really bad. I don't know what it was. I a couple times boys would give me like notes. I remember, and then I it, it would say like call me and stuff. So I'd call them, and then I kind of had somewhat of a bold personality, I guess. And I'd be like, okay, well, take me out. Because if you're going to write me a note, right? And then I wouldn't hear from them again. So I kind of steamrolled a couple boys, I guess. I don't know. How about you? No, I was I was never bold. Like, I wish I had been. If I could go back and tell my 16-year-old self some advice, I would be like, just get out there and live your life. Like, it doesn't matter. And if you get rejected, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. And those, like, you you just wish you could tell your teen self, like, those boys would be so fucking lucky to go out with you. Like, they all want to go out with you, and you don't even realize it. And so we should have just gone and asked all them out. The, I mean, the cute ones. So if Basket Case taught me anything. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also, don't discriminate against conjoined twins, right? <laughs> right. So speaking of which, I mean, conjoined twins are a thing, and they're fascinating, I mean, we have probably one of the most famous cases of conjoined twins um, living in Minnesota. It's the the sisters who share a body and they have their but they have two heads. They're elementary school teachers now. I was looking up where they are and they're in the Twin Cities somewhere. Yeah, a family friend is an elementary school teacher and she worked in the same building. So yeah, they they do teach. Um, and I mean, it's fascinating. I mean, you know. Last week we were talking about TLC shows and it's like, you know, we've all seen sort of TLC shows about these sorts of things. And it's sort of like, wow, the human body is amazing and that, you know, two people can be sharing bodies. And, you know, there's obviously the famous, I think it's Chang and Ang, the famous, they were Siamese and that's where the term Siamese twins came along. But that's not, we don't say that anymore. We say conjoined twins, but... 
Um, I don't know. It's a, it is fascinating. And I, you know, here's the thing when there's the X-Files episode humbug in which, um, and there are like instances too of kind of like this situation where, um, in, in real life where instead of it being a, like a, person that there is like a twin that's attached to your body that didn't form fully like a dermoid yeah like a dermoid but I I liked in humbug the x-files episode that the one that detached off of him and then attached back on which does not happen in this but um I liked that Leonard I think it was Leonard and Lenny um that he didn't like what his twin got up to and you could argue that that happens in this movie, but I feel like the the guy, I think it's David. I don't know. Am I just making that up? It doesn't matter. Anyway, the dude that's not Belial, um, he seems too complicit to me in everything. Like I kind of, I kind of feel like he, and I understand it's about brotherly love, but I don't know. What do you feel about that? Yeah, I think it's a more interesting narrative, like you said, in in Humbug, when it's it's not all. I mean, there's that that need to protect and to love your sibling yet this isn't right. And maybe it would be okay if we're not together kind of thing. Well, yeah. Cause I mean, he goes to New York to kill these doctors and stuff yeah. and it's like, okay. And then, you know, that is, that can be a problem when we're trying to watch him like romance the secretary and stuff. It's like, he isn't a good guy because he is complicit in this. He's walking around with the file with blood all over it. Like he knows what's going on. He knows what his brother is capable of. Um, you know, so one could argue it's kind of hard to have him be the protagonist of the movie and to really worry about what's going to happen to him. True. You know, get a couple of beers in this guy, though, and he spills his guts, right? <laughs> no pun intended. Yeah, that was interesting. And that that was actually, that was a pretty well done when he's like, yeah, my brother's in there. And then they laugh. And then it's like, no, really, my brother's in there. And um, I love how these neighbors in this hotel, they just don't give up on this place. Like all this stuff keeps happening and they just keep living there. Oh, good point. I guess New York, right? It's pro- they've probably seen crazier shit. It's only $20 a night. Like you can't beat that. <laughs> yeah, you can't be picky. So, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't know this movie. It was like when I was watching Dolls, I was smiling the whole time because I was enjoying it. This movie was just sort of like, oh, like, wow, they're going there. Oh, okay. Like, it was just kind of like, sometimes I'd be kind of like smiling, like, okay, this is kind of funny or cool. And then I would kind of be like, oh, okay. Like, I don't know. It, it was just like, um, it wasn't a, a complete feeling the whole way through. It was definitely, like I said, a roller coaster. So I, like, I mentioned the things that I appreciated right off the top. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to let bad acting and low budget get in the way because you know I've enjoyed some of those bad acting low budget movies um and I appreciated some of the gore and the flashback sequence of the twin being removed and then cutting the dad in half like I I appreciated that I like the poetry of cutting the dad in half I appreciate the symbolism then the movie took a turn for me um first of all the he took her underwear and then this prolonged boob shot and I didn't appreciate it. And also, would like, would you be able to sleep through somebody poking your nipple? Yeah, I was thinking that too. So he climbs into bed. So Belial, even though he's like a deformed little thing, he, he's a sexual being too. <laughs> I mean, okay. <laughs> so he climbs into bed with this woman. And then, of course, it, the male gaze, of course, uh, works overtime. It is an 80s horror movie. So, I mean, the boob shot, okay, that didn't bother me too much. Um, yeah, I know. He was like poking her nipple and it's like, wow, she sleeps really deep, like 30 seconds into falling asleep. Um, he takes her underwear. That didn't bother me too much. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, I, obviously I know where you're going with this and it gets a lot worse. That part, at that point, I just thought, well, it's the eighties and he stole her underwear and it's kind of gross to think about him being sexual. But, you know, when, when he has sex with the corpse, yeah. I wrote, like, okay, I'm done. Like, I'm done taking notes. Like, the rest of the movie can play out, but I'm checked out. Yeah. Um. Well, and this is, like, a good – I guess this is a good moment of, like, what are we looking for in horror movies? Do, is that appropriate? Do we need to see that? Is it – is I mean, this is art 
so to speak. This is someone's film. For me personally, that part really was disturbing. I did not like it. It was upsetting. There was like blood involved. It was really, oh, it was too much. And it, uh, it takes a lot to offend me. But yeah, I, it was, it was like, oh, okay, that's now I'm. But I can see how some people might say, well, you know, that's I like that over the top approach. I don't know. I don't know. You know, it just it wasn't for me. And in that moment, uh, I mean, the 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 nipple poking is what did it for me. It was so unrealistic. No, but then it just, you know, obviously got worse. Are there a bunch of sequels to this movie? There are. Yeah, there are. They live through the fall, I guess, at the end of this movie. <laughs> if you guys can see Kelly's face right now, <laughs> she's so over it. If I could roll my eyes on audio, it would it would be happening. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, I, I don't mind necessarily that he even went and killed the girlfriend. It just, they took it a little too far with the raping the corpse. It was just really disturbing, and it was like, I don't know, it was too much. I understand, but at the same time, I feel like this need to say, like, well, that's what they chose to do, and, and they can choose to do that. Like, we were talking the other day, there's something for everybody, we were saying, and like, you know, I can see how there is an audience for this. But I I would be interested to see what that audience looks like. You know? Yeah. I mean, there's there probably are basket case defenders out there. And maybe you'll be tweeting us after this episode. I don't know. I, I really liked it in the beginning. And then it just continued to go downhill. So I'm sorry, Meg. No, I'm, I'm right there with you where it's like we have to look at things from, you know, part of what we do is we look at things from a feminist perspective. And, you know, it's one thing to steal a lady's underwear, but it's another thing to show this thing. I mean, not even – this was not an implication. This was showing him raping her after she's dead and, there, and it, there's blood everywhere. And it was just, like, unnecessary. And as a woman, it's just offensive. Well, as a human being. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're going to rank this. And I'm just going to say let's rank it on burgers. Because I don't even want to think about anything else in this movie. So the burgers that he brings his brother in the basket. Zero being you hated it. Ten being it's a perfect movie. How many burgers do you give Basket Case? Well, here's what I'm going to say. I still think it's a great idea for a movie. I would love to see this movie reimagined. By somebody with more talent and money. <laughs> or even the same amount of money, but more talent. Because um, I think the idea that you have your deformed brother in a basket, that's a gr- I love it. I love it. So I, if on the idea alone, I'm going to give it a, th- I'm going to give it three burgers because it's a great idea and they went for it, but they overshot the mark and um, that type of horror just isn't for me, I guess. So I started off feeling like six burgers. I'm like, yeah, I, this premise is great. And I don't even mind the low budgetness. And then when it took the turn, I would give it zero burgers. Like it's just an empty wrapper for me. I think that's fair. It's time for our fast forward segment. And I wanted to share what we've been reading lately in the world of horror. If you're a reader Um, If you listen to our episode from earlier this, or I guess it was last year now, earlier this fall, I was going to say, it's about the TV show You. And I just read the sequel to that book based on, um, the show's based on the novel You by Carolyn Kepnes. And there's a sequel called Hidden Bodies. And I just finished reading it and I handed it off to Meg and she's going to read it next. And Meg... Just you're not going to believe what Joe Goldberg gets up to. <laughs> oh, I'm excited. I just had a conversation about you on um, I was interviewed for Talking Wicked um, and we talked about like sort of what it what it means to have that sort of character. And, and but I'm only co- was able to talk about the TV experience because I haven't read the book. And I know you were saying when it's the book, it's like even harder to separate yourself from Joe. <laughs> Well, yeah, because you're seeing it from his perspective. And not that this is similar, but it's like reading the Twilight books. When you read from Bella's perspective, you're seeing these other people through her lens. And so you feel the way 
about Edward that she does because that's how she's describing him. Or you feel like Jacob smells like a dog because you're, you're, you know, she's describing it that way to you and you're seeing it through her way. But then when we saw the Twilight movies, we're like, wait a minute. I don't know. That's how I felt. It was like, wait a minute. Jacob's cuter. There, I said it. I said it. She's team Jacob, you guys. <laughs> so just like what, 10, 15 years too late. <laughs> yeah. This is so controversial. Um, and so with Joe's perspective, telling these stories, not that I'm giving him a pass for murdering people, but it's interesting to read it from his perspective and be like, oh, wait, Joe. Yeah, I'm agreeing with you. Wait, I shouldn't be. Yeah, I mean. I always talk about sort of the difference between I write short stories and novels and, and how I think in a short story you can write a character like Joe because you're not asking somebody to go on an entire novel journey with somebody who is a bad person. So that this is a testament to obviously her talent because I don't know if I could write a novel with a Joe type character because that is a tightrope to walk for that long uh, now it's a book series and I mean it's really a testament to to what she can accomplish because that would be a tall order and clearly she's done it so um there's another book I haven't started it yet but and it's not in this series but uh, she also wrote Providence and it's more supernatural um horror uh so I'm looking forward to that just to see sort of how that world gets built and, and what happens in that what have you been reading lately well, I've been listening to, re- well, I've read it before, but I'm listening to The Stand on audio. Um, I've been doing a lot of Audible lately. It's just, you know, it's nice. I, I keep painting rooms in my house so I can listen to Audible. And uh, what else? Oh, there's this really cool app that I want to, like, tell everybody about called Serial Reader. And what it is, it's free. You can buy, like, a, you know, $3, like, upcharge or something if you want the premium but what it, it's what it does is every day it brings you just a little small section of of a book um like a 10 minute reading section and it dings your phone to kind of remind you that you should be reading and they're mostly like classic books but what it does is it sort of makes you feel like you can get through these classic books in small bite-sized chunks so every day at three o'clock I get a little ding that um, I'm, I'm trying to read, uh, Villette by Charlotte Bronte. And it's one of those things where it's like sitting down to read that book would feel like daunting, but knowing I just have a 10 minute chunk that's coming that you can pretty much sit on the toilet and read is really nice. So I've been reading that. And then I also started, um, 20th century ghosts because I love Joe Hill. I worship Joe Hill. Strange weather. If you, I don't know if, have you read that? It is so amazing. I read it earlier this, well, I don't know, I guess it was later last year. Oh my God, so good. Uh, it's like four novellas, I think. And so this is more short stories. And I just read the first short story, which was so apropos. It's about a horror writer. Um, and so I very much enjoyed it. But I, So I'm kind of like all over the map reading everything right now. Tell me the name of the app again. It's called Serial Reader. And you can choose from a bunch of different classic books. And it's just a nice little way to remind yourself to read and like you know do it in a way and it also kind of like mirrors the old-fashioned way people used to read like Charles Dickens books used to come you know in um, periodicals that would come and you'd read it almost like a magazine and so I think it just gives more digestible bites so I love it I remember when Stephen King released the Green Mile like that in the little chunks and I mean that built a lot of anticipation and it's it's fun. No, that's a great idea. Like you said, when you sometimes when you sit down and even just feeling the weight of the book or seeing how many pages, it's like, oh my god, I'm only this far or something. Is it worth it? It that makes it sound a lot a lot more approachable. So thank you for the tip. Yeah, I think especially classics too, because I mean, let's I mean we have to admit the language sometimes can be a barrier because it's just it's it's a slog sometimes if you don't understand or like there are references that you don't get because these books are so old and so just feeling like it's just a little bit shorter and and workable. Yeah, I love it. Horror Rewind listeners, we want to hear what you're reading, so make sure to tweet us, email us, go to our other social media, and let us know what you recommend in the world of horror or otherwise until next time we'll see you in the horror section